Hey, everybody. Okay, so um, I want to thank all of you who have been concerned that I'm flat out exhausted from my move. And uh, I am, but I'm here. <laughs> Um, so it's Elizabeth Cronice McLaughlin, Resistance Live first. Uh, well, actually, that's not true, because I broadcasted from this house, I think, like, last month when I was here picking up the keys. Anyway, first broadcast from, like, permanent residency in California. So um, I, am, uh, I am way beat. My movers are not here yet. My dog is not here yet. My car is not here yet. But I am here for all of you. <laughs> so um, good morning from California. Um, and uh, let's see. We got a lot going on that I want to talk about and a lot of questions. But, you know, first things first, uh, I want to thank all of our supporters on Patreon, as always, um, patreon.com slash resistance live for helping us to support our team and our staff. Um, and I uh, just want to remind you all, because I don't talk about this very often, but, you know, like I'm getting nudges from my COO to just mention this again. Um, you all know, I hope you all know that we do women's leadership and diversity and inclusion work inside major corporations um, and also online. You all know that already. But if you happen to be working someplace that could benefit from what we do, just don't hesitate to reach out, please. Info at GaiaLeadershipProject.com. We've got like a bunch of Fortune 100 companies, 50 companies that we're working with right now. And uh, yours could be next. So, um, all right. So let's just talk through uh, what's going on in the Manafort trial for a minute because there's a, a fair amount of, um, of really serious breaking stuff around the exhibits that Mueller has um, put in. So I want to say a couple of things about this first and foremost. Um, the last major trial that I did, which was a trial in the Southern District of New York, was um, a case that uh, involved a board of directors of a very, very well-known, massive uh, international conglomerate. And um, it was a $350 million damages case, um, like huge, right, by, by most standards, especially given that it was almost 10 years ago now that I tried this case. We did not have as many exhibits as what Robert Mueller has said he's going to use in the Manafort trial. And... That's saying something because the trial that we did ran like for weeks and weeks on end. And, you know, I mean, I, you know, I've been in cases involving cases that were huge class actions that had like, you know, 500 plus exhibits, but not ones that are just like the prosecution of one human being. So he's got a lot. He's got a lot on Paul Manafort. Um, and, you know, to the point where the, some of the best trial lawyers I know are already going like he better whittle that down because the jury is going to be. The jury's going to be upset by how many exhibits they've got to they've got to work through, unless of course he tries it in the way that great trial lawyers do, which is you know it's all fun. Um, in any event, one of the key things that came out of this list of uh, of potential trial exhibits was this: a series of emails dating back to 2014 between Paul Manafort and Tad Devine. Now, for those of you who don't know Tad Devine, he was the chief strategist for Bernie San Sanders' presidential campaign. And the last of these emails uh, is before the time that he was hired by the Bernie Sanders campaign. It's very curious. Um, and, you know, I will just add that, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about this online in the last couple of days. But you all may remember that there were a couple of really curious votes by Bernie on Russian sanctions where everybody was kind of like, what's he doing? Like, why, why, why is he voting that way? That's so weird. And there was an explanation put out about it, because it happened more than once, that many of us kind of like were evaluating as it was happening live. But the other flip side of where we are right now is that he has been remarkably silent, remarkably silent on this particular issue since these trial exhibits came out and on the Mueller probe. So, you know, I, I want to say one thing, because I know we have a lot of people who were very pro-Bernie who follow along on this feed. I want to say one thing. I have said all along, like from way back, that, you know, and, and at the bare minimum from like the beginning of Me Too, okay, that we were going to have to be prepared for our icons to fall if that was what it was going to take to clean house. Um, and, you know, I said it about Al Franken. And I said it about several others. I said it about Charlie Rose. You know, I've, I've said it every step along the way about revelations of things that we would not tolerate that are attributable to people who we otherwise have liked a lot. And I was never in Bernie's camp. I mean, everybody who's watched this for a long time knows that. But I just want to say this to those of you who have followed Bernie. You may have to let this one go. Because there's a reason why Tad Devine is on those emails with Paul Manafort and that it's being included in a case involving Paul Manafort's money laundering with the Russians. We don't know why yet, 
but they're the first exhibits that you know are listed in the trial exhibits for Robert Mueller's prosecution of Paul Manafort in the Eastern District of Virginia. So just stay tuned. Just stay tuned. You know, and I think there's like a lot more that we're going to learn about this as time goes on. And you know, somebody said to me this morning, a very prominent DC operative who was texting me this morning, said. Are they all involved? Is that what this is coming down to? And I said, well, it may be that they're all involved except for the woman and the black president who supported her. You know, we'll have to wait and see. You know, I think there's a lot of questions right now about what's going to be left when all of this really comes to light. Um, all right. So that's just something you got to pay attention to. And I want to encourage those of you who are still in Bernie's camp or were in Bernie's camp to just pause and wait and see what happens here. Do not leap to his defense. It doesn't look good. And we need to be prepared at this point to see what develops from this. Um, you know, Bernie has not denied, by the way, that, you know, that, that they, he might have taken Russian money. So let's just, let's just see what happens on this run. Okay. Um, uh, Linda, for you who's saying, wow, I wish the trial was public. Let me just reiterate what I said on Wednesday, which is this. Um, federal trials are not televised, but that doesn't mean there's not going to be reporters in the courtroom. Um, and indeed, we, there have been reporters in the courtroom at every single Manafort hearing that we've had so far. And you can rest assured that there's going to be uh, reporters in, the, in that courtroom for the duration of that trial who will be reporting on the testimony that was taken word for word. Um, don't forget as well, the trial transcripts are generated. So we're going to get to see those too, assuming that they're not filed under seal. So um, there's a lot, a lot um, that we're going to learn from, uh, you know, the beginning of this trial all the way through to the end. And please don't forget, it starts Wednesday. Like, this is not happening six months from now. It starts Wednesday. <laughs> um, which, by the way, I will just reiterate, means that if Manafort wants to flip, this weekend would be the time. So, you know, it's Friday in Trump land. You never know. But he's, uh, he's lost every single motion that he's filed so far in front of this judge. Um, and I will tell you from having appeared in front of Judge Ellis, he is a take no shit kind of judge. So if Manafort wants to plead, like now would be the time. Um, all right. So uh, the, next the next thing that I just want to mention to all of you is that, you know, we've had a lot of questions on the feed, and I've addressed this several times in, from different incarnations, about um, the, si the sanctity of our elections. And there, you know, there was something really weird that happened yesterday on Twitter. I don't know if you guys were following along with this, but um, one of the alt press secretary accounts got a hold of a voting machine out of one of the counties in Ohio where there were apparently an enormous amount of votes for Trump, like way beyond what people thought was normal. And that voting machine, which was sold, by the way, by the county without being scrubbed, like that in and of itself is really troubling to me because it's like if anybody wanted to kind of like go in there and figure out how to hack it, that would be one way to do it, right? Um, it's now been given to a researcher who is evaluating what's contained on this particular machine for purposes of really kind of trying to determine the security, not just the security of the machine, but also like what's contained on it. Is there a possibility that, you know, these machines were hacked? Um, so uh, that is something to absolutely keep an eye on. But, you know, I just want to reiterate this. I still want to remind you guys that the Electoral College was won by a scant 70,000 votes, okay? And... The, it, you know, what we know so far about the interference is that it was in particular counties that were particularly blue that could throw particular states, right? This is the reporting, if you guys remember, that came out of the Dallas Morning News last year about the fact that, for instance, like Tarrant County, Texas was targeted, which is very blue. The one right next door to it was not. And the voter rolls were targeted, um, meaning that, you know, there's a possibility. And, you know, how else would you, I mean, in some sense, you just have to, like, remark on the, the brilliance of this, the, the insane brilliance of it. That, you know, if you pack a voter roll and you remove people from the voter rolls, they can't vote. It doesn't even matter what's happening with the ballots. If people show up and their names aren't on the voter rolls, they're not going to be allowed to vote, right? So paper ballots would be meaningless in that circumstance. But in any event, the thing I want to remind you all of is 70,000 votes is not a lot. And... The cybersecurity of our elections is like, and the Republicans did something horrible yesterday. I, I hope you all saw this. You know, Adam Schiff was tweeting about it. Um, that there was an effort made to put up um, <clears throat> to funding, additional funding for our election security that was voted down completely by the Republicans. Um, the, basically, they've zeroed out the election security funds now um, by 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 legislation. It's just, I mean, it's it's horrifying. Anyway, so my point about this is this: seventy thousand votes is not a lot, and I want to remind you all that if we get out the vote in in numbers that they cannot mess with, the election will be fine. But the get out the vote effort is really, as I have been saying now for the last few months, one of the most critical aspects of the 2018 election. It's so important, like so important. 
Um, and you know, we all we all need to take a, a, a real lesson here. I'm just going to say this from the women at Black Voters Matter who are getting out the vote in the Deep South and who are organizing from the grassroots uh, ground up through community organizations and black churches and um, you know family members and you know other community oriented events to drive to the polls to drive one another to the polls to make sure everybody get, gets out to vote this by the way is how Doug Jones beat Roy Moore in Alabama by like you know a slim margin it was because black voters matter and the women who founded that organization organized like you would not believe and they are out of Alabama now and they are organizing throughout the entire deep south and we need to we need to like follow their lead everywhere um do not assume that you know your get out the vote effort has to be some kind of big mass thing right you don't have to stand on the corner in New York City and ask people if they're registered to vote you could just knock on your neighbor's door you know you can go to your church or your synagogue or your yoga class and ask people if they are registered to vote um, it's incredibly important to do that. Michelle Obama did, yes, I know, with Lin-Manuel Miranda and a number of other celebrities uh, get on this issue yesterday as well. But I just want to say, like, please do your part on this front. Like, do your part. There are, like, millions, by the way, of folks who have recently turned 18 in time for this election. And we're watching the March for Our Lives kids go out and get people registered to vote all across the country this summer. But, you know, there's already something like 4 million kids who have turned 18 in Florida alone in the last year. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we've absolutely got to be a part of this effort to get the vote out as much as humanly possible. Um, all right. Butina. So, um, you know, I, when Butina was arrested a few days ago, and then we saw the indictment and we saw the affidavits um, from the prosecuting team about why it was that she should be held without bail, there, you know, there, there's a lot there. Let me just say that. There's a lot there. I also was immediately cautioning, like, please don't assume that this is Red Sparrow. Let's not assume that if she's a spy, she's also trading sex for espionage. Uh, she's, she traded sex for espionage. I just have to say, like, I called that one wrong. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, reporting on this. She was um, living with, sleeping with Paul Erickson, who happens to be one of the biggest Republican strategists out there. Um, there are some indications that she also offered to trade sex for a position in the NRA, uh, if that happens to be the unnamed political organization that's discussed in the indictment. Um, and, of course, Alexander Torshin, you know, Russian oligarch, uh, former Russian politician, one of Putin's right-hand hand men, um, was her handler. And so uh, very little doubt, very little doubt at this point that the Butina case is going to go all the way to the top. Um, now, I, I want to remind you all, because I've said it over and over and over and over again, it is not in the president's best interest to pardon someone affiliated with the Russia probe, because then they will not have any way to avoid testifying against him, okay? So I'm not expecting that there's going to be a pardon here. I do think that the Butina case is absolutely one to watch, and we learned yesterday that there's at least one American citizen, I am assuming this is Eric Erickson, but we do not know, who is wrapped up in this already and under investigation, him or herself. So the Butina story is far from over. Um, and again, this case is pending in the District Court for the District of Columbia, which is not the rocket docket. I want to remind you all, like somebody asked me about this today. The Eastern District of Virginia is the um, federal district court that is known as the rocket docket. That's the one, you know, you guys have heard this story before where I did my first federal court argument. It has it stamped outside the building like justice delayed is justice denied. Like they're serious. That's where Paul Manafort is going to trial on Wednesday. Like. Not a full year since the first indictment dropped against him. That was last October. Like, it's really fast for a case of this size and this magnitude. Um, and that's the way the rocket docket works. Butina was arrested and, and is being prosecuted in the District Court for the District of Columbia, which, by the way, you may remember, as we have talked about before on the broadcast, is a court that is profoundly familiar with handling cases of political import. This is where Scooter Libby, Libby's case was pending. This is where um, quite a number of other indictments that relate to kind of past political scandals have been handled. So um, again, no shock about this, um, but don't expect that Boutina is going to be tried like in rapid succession in the way that Manafort was, unless there's a desire for that to happen. Um, and we also don't know whether or not she's going to flip. If she flips, Lord help us, because I have a feeling we're going to learn a lot more stuff than what we know already. And by the way, I want to remind you all, we don't even know the depth of what Robert Mueller knows about her. And I want to make one other really important point here. She is not being prosecuted by Robert Mueller's prosecutors. So one of the other things that's really curious about this, which has been pointed out on Rachel, but you may have missed, is that 
Mueller continues, apparently, to kind of like farm out prosecutions, right? We saw this with Michael Cohen. Like that whole case is now being handled out of the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York. Simultaneously, we've got a case now being handled by the counter espionage team at the DOJ um, in the District Court for the District of Columbia against Maria Butina. That's not Mueller's team either. So one of the things about this that you ought to keep in mind when there's all these threats to fire Mueller is like those, two, those cases don't go away. And he's very plainly, from a strategic standpoint, protecting his own interests by doing that. Robert Mueller is, okay? So last thing I want to mention today, because the, the, there's a little bit of breaking news here about Butina that continues to unfold that we all need to pay attention to, and it is this. There are indications that through Butina, uh, cabinet nominations may have been vetted by the Russians. Uh, there is an email um, shortly after the election that we are aware of, or a text message, I can't remember which one, it might even have been a Twitter DM, where uh, Butina asked Torshin what our people thought about a, a Secretary of State nominee. Um, and there's been a lot of speculation that this may have been the reason why Trump went from you know, Mitt Romney, who was his first pick, over to Rex Tillerson, who he had not even met by the time the election happened, um, at the suggestion of the Russians. It raises other issues here because there are questions about how the deputy um, uh, national security advisor, KT McFarland, came to be nominated that are potentially implicated in what happened here. There's a lot of big question marks. So um, this is the last thing I want to say about all of this. Um, we knew it was bad, you know, and, and I, I tweeted something about this yesterday about the, you know, all of us who were like throwing up and on the floor and crying and dry heaving and like shaking, physically shaking on the night of the election, unable to kind of like offload what we had just seen. Um, I'm a big believer in intuition, as many of you know, like this is one of the things that makes me really good at my job, um, is that I, that I tend to be very intuitive and I'm a sensitive human being and I know a lot of the people who follow along here are too. I just want to reiterate to all of you, it's way worse than anything that we had expected. And we don't even know the depths to which this goes yet. You know, again, this DC strategist who I was talking to this morning, we were like, what's going to be left when this is all over? Like, are we going to be rebuilding a brand new government? Maybe. Um, you know, but the point of this is this. The corruption goes profoundly deep, like deeper than any of us could have, ex could have expected or known at that point. We might have felt it in our bones, right? We might have felt it in our bodies, but the level to which this goes is still unknown. The depth of the corruption that is associated with this is still unknown, but we're starting to see the end of it. And, you know, Butina goes all the way to the top. If the Russians were handpicking cabinet members... But I mean, we're in for a world of hurt on this front going forward for those people and anybody who was involved. Um, and I, you know, I firmly believe, by the way, that anybody who had her, had her or his hands anywhere near Maria Butina is going to be in a world of hurt going forward. Um, so in any event, that's where we find ourselves on another Friday in Trump land. Um, I want to thank all of you, of course, as always, who support us on Patreon. If you would care to join up there, we would greatly appreciate even your $2 a month, patreon.com slash resistance live. Um, action items for today. Please do not forget about the children at the border. There was a breaking bit of news last night um, about the fact that only 364 out of 2,500 have yet been returned to their parents. Please don't forget them in your phone calls. It's so important. And make sure, by the way, that you are continuing to resist and activate around Brett Kavanaugh's Supreme Court nomination because it is critical to the future of our democracy and to the rights of all of us that he is not nominated to the Supreme Court and that this president is not allowed to make another nomination until this investigation comes to a close. Um, and lastly, for God's sake, do not let up on the demands for impeachment and his removal from office because um, we know right now, and I will say it again, and it was said yesterday in Aspen, none of this ends until he's gone. All right? Lots of love to all of you. I'll be online as much as I can today. I got a lot of stuff going down in my house, um, but I will, I will be there. Um, all right. Lots of love to all of you. Have a great Friday and a great weekend. I'll talk to you on Monday. All right. Bye.